So good morning to those of you who are joining us in the Americas. Good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining us from other parts of the world. Um, my name is Manjiri Mahajan. I'm Associate Professor for International Affairs at the New School and also co-director of its India-China Institute. Um, I would like to welcome you to today's panel, which is titled Transforming Global Governance Institutions in a Shifting World Order. Um, the panel is co-sponsored and co-organized by the New Schools India-China Institute um, and its graduate program in international affairs. So we are meeting today at a time marked by intense conflict in Europe and in the Middle East, um, disarray in terrains of international trade, finance, and much more, and seismic shifts in domestic orders in many countries around the world. In response to these upheavals and shifts, this year at the India-China Institute, we have organized a series of panels that seek to examine um, the erosion of an older international order that has long been characterized by the dominance of the US-European axis. So through our conversations this semester and next semester, we hope to look at how older institutional arrangements of globalization and multilateralism um, and putatively liberal norms of internationalism are being challenged and increasingly transformed. And we want to look at how new arrangements, political, economic, technological, are taking hold. So earlier this semester, we had a panel on how domestic political regimes in many countries are turning to great authoritarianism and the implications this has for international relations. We also last month had a panel on shifting contours of global food security. Um, today's panel, which is the third in this series, examines transformations within extant global governance organizations, such as the United Nations and the International Criminal Court. Um, many of these organizations were constituted in the aftermath of the world wars. They were forged in the crucible of Cold War politics. Um, and with the downfall of the Soviet Union, they have been increasingly dominated by interests and ideologies of the United States. Uh, but today, what we hope to examine is how some of these existing governance institutions are changing, are being transformed in a context of increasing multipolarity um, of the obvious growing power of countries like China, but also more assertive voices from the African Union, from Latin America, from the Middle East, from India, and more. So for this discussion today, we have, I think, an exceptional panel of speakers whom I will have the privilege of introducing. Um, I'll give very brief introductions of each speaker who will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Um, I should note that our chat function is disabled for the audience, but the audience are, members are encouraged to place the questions in the question and answer box. So let me introduce our speakers. Um, our first speaker will be Professor Omar Ba. Omar Ba is an assistant professor in the Department of Government at Cornell University. Um, his writings, like the writings of all our panelists, have appeared in a range of both academic journals and popular publications, and I won't go through all of them. But I did want to note that he is the author of the book, States of Justice, the Politics of the International Criminal Court, um, that was published in 2020. Our second speaker will be Professor um, Xiao Ren, who is currently a professor of international politics at the Institute of International Studies at Fudong University in Shanghai, China. Um, he's also the director of the Center for the Study of Chinese Foreign Policy. Um, his publications include multiple co-edited volumes, including Human Security and Cross-Border Cooperation in East Asia, Chinese Foreign Aid, Theory and Practice, and New Frontiers in China's Foreign Relations. Our third speaker will be Professor Tan Sen Sen, who is Director of the Center for Global Asia and Associate Full Professor of History at NYU Shanghai. He is the author of Buddhism, Diplomacy and Trade, the Realignment of Sino-Indian Relations um, and India, China and the World, a Connected History. He is co-author of Traditional China in Asian and World History and editor of Buddhism Across Asia, Networks of Material, Cultural, and Intellectual Exchange. Um, I should note here that both Professor Sen and Professor Xiao Ren are joining us from China, where it's already 9 p.m., so we really appreciate your accommodating our time zone. Um, 
But we will also have a final fourth speaker who will be Professor Arlene Tickner. She is full professor at the Universidad del Rosario's Faculty of International Political and Urban Studies in Colombia. She is the co-editor of multiple books in the series on Worlding Beyond the West. Her co-edited volumes include International Relations from the Global South and Thinking International Relations Differently. Um, Professor Tickner is currently serving as ambassador and deputy permanent representative of Colombia to the United Nations. So we especially appreciate Professor Tickner your being able to give us time today. So without much further ado, we should get started and I'm going to hand it over to Professor Bach. Thank you, uh, Professor Mahajan. Um, good morning to all, or good evening for our colleagues in China. Um, thank you for bringing us uh, together on, on this panel, and this is quite a timely discussion, given that um, what we've seen over the past few weeks is uh, a lot of uh, challenges to the liberal international order and also many challenges about the tools available um, to the international community to face uh, a number of uh, current crises. My uh, preliminary uh, remarks will focus on the international legal order, understood to be uh, a set of uh, institutions, uh, for the most part, created after World War II, and different uh, mechanisms of uh, adju adjudicating uh, international justice. I'll draw from a couple of uh, key moments in, in recent history from, from an African perspective to show how um, some African states and uh, a number of African voices tried to challenge the, the international order and uh, reorient it towards uh, other directions. Um, earlier this year, last March, the International Criminal Court issued a warrant for the arrest of, um, of Vladimir Putin and uh, another Russian official named Maria Bilova. That was a, a watershed moment in, uh, in uh, international criminal law, in global politics as well, because not only was this the first time that a sitting president of world power was indicted by a, um, an international criminal court, but if you think of it, since 1945, there has been no citizen of the P5 members who have been indicted by an international criminal court. So not at Nuremberg, not in Tokyo, not in the host of ad hoc and hybrid tribunals that's been put in place, um, whether we are thinking of uh, Cambodia, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone, uh, Lebanon. So there's been a host of both ad hoc and hybrid international criminal tribunals and the International Criminal Court, which is the first permanent one. There's been no single citizen of the P5 members who has faced justice at any of these courts. So then the, the indictment of Putin, although it's a very unlikely that he will ever end up in The Hague, just the indictment itself um, is, is an important moment here. Now, the thing is that Putin and, and Bilova were charged with the war crime of um, deportation of children from Ukraine to, to Russia. So that's the charge, war crime of deportation of children. One would think that the most obvious crime that Putin could have been charged would be the crime of aggression, which is an international crime. But here is the thing, um, the ICC cannot charge Putin for the crime of aggression. Why? Because although this is one of the main reasons for the creation of the Permanent International Criminal Court, the, there has been so much a push to make 
the crime of aggression almost out of reach from international courts. And this push has come mostly from Western powers. So states like the United States have pushed very strongly to make sure that the ICC is almost unable to prosecute crimes of aggression because they wanted to shield themselves from that possibility of being held accountable if they were ever invade another country. Now, how did we get here? Well, you know, um, when this is where, where Africa comes in, because during the process of creating this international legal order, there's been always a number of voices from the global south, in, including Africa, that tried to steer the system into a direction that would be able to hold the powerful actors accountable and their allies as well. But there's been always a pushback from Western states, from powerful states, to make international law not a set of neutral principles for justice, but rather, um, paraphrasing Siba Brovagi here, making international law basically an ordering language, uh, a disciplining language, a language that establishes hierarchies of who may be prosecuted for what crime before which court. To understand the current legal international order and the grammars of international justice, I think, would require to go back to the four core international crimes and how they got to be codified to be the crimes that are of the concern of uh, the international community. And these four crimes are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and aggression. You would notice that these crimes are a direct legacy from Nuremberg and the Tokyo tribunals as well. And this is not by accident. This is by design. Yet at every turn, African states have tried to stir the international legal order towards a more just and a more balanced uh, uh, direction that would place equal human dignity at, at the center of the system and also a system that would protect the humanity against the abuse by great powers and their close allies. Once institutions are put in place, they become, they become very hard to actually reform. Um, one example is the UN or the UN Security Council. So the moments of possibility tends to be that moment in which the institutions is being debated, deliberated to put in place. The institutional design is up for discussion. These are the key moments here. And if we go back to such moments, we can find that there's been a long tradition of African states making some proposals that end up being shut down or not adopted which leads to institutions that look so much different from what African states had proposed. Two key moments here are the drafting of the Code of Crimes Against Peace and the Security of Mankind, which was drafted in 1996, and the drafting of the Rome Statute of the ICC. Now, briefly, for the draft of Code of Crimes, um, in 1996, the final version identified four kind of crimes to be qualified as international crimes. So genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and later on they added the crime against the UN personnel. But an earlier version of this, which was led by the special rapporteur Dudu Chan from Senegal, had proposed instead of those four crimes, 11 crimes to be included and codified as international crimes. And these crimes included not only the four core crimes, but colonialism as an international crime, apartheid as an international crime, recruitment, use, and training of mercenaries as an international crime, illicit traffic in narcotic drugs, international terrorism, and also willful and severe damage to the environment. 
these are the co the number of crimes that African states have tried to get the international community to qualify as international crime and be able to prosecute them. But of course, this attempt has been uh, unsuccessful. For the ICC, African states also have pushed during the negotiations to make sure that their, the court would be universal instead of just having a number of states willingly join in others um, subtracting themselves out of the jurisdiction of the court, making sure that the court will be totally independent from the security council, so as to not politicize um, which cases uh, end up uh, at, at the courts, making sure also that there is um, a general uh, sense of sovereign equality of all states when it comes to international law. These proposals can be also traced back to all the key moments in, in, in the post-World War II history of the Global South. When we go back and think of the Bandung Principles, which codified um, self-determination as, uh, as a right for all states, racial equality um, called for total disarmament and peace, uh, full coexistence between uh, all states. So um, to conclude, I'll, I'll just say that um, African states have known for a very long time that international law is not emancipatory. It is rather a means to hegemony and they have tried to correct that to make actually international law truly uh, emancipatory. Um, because this proposal oftentimes do not succeed, one alternative would be to think through regional mechanisms, create regional courts that would um, try to push for, for that agenda. And we can see a similar attempt with the Malabo Protocol, for instance, for African states. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omar. I mean, I think you've put a lot on the table that hopefully we'll be able to come back to um, in the question and answer discussion part. Okay. Um, yeah, unlike uh, others, uh, I do have a PowerPoint, uh, maybe because I'm a historian rather than a political scientist. Uh, uh, but uh, what I'm, I'm looking at and interested as a historian uh, is to, to see the connection between heritage uh, and politics. Uh, this, result, uh, this comes out from my interest in uh, looking at what's uh, happening in both China and India with regard to the use of history. Uh, but also being involved in the in the research uh, on uh, how UNESCO and uh, the idea of maritime Silk Road came about. Uh, and additionally, a third issue that uh, uh, the reason I'm interested in this topic is because I was part of a UNESCO a committee called ICOMOS, which was uh, looking at uh, you know, nominating maritime Silk Road uh, as a World Heritage Site. So this these are the three reasons uh, that I got interested in this and, and looking at how this combination of China and UNESCO uh, is resulting in changes to the uh, world order with regard to heritage uh, and the concept of heritage, uh, as those of you who do heritage uh, would certainly know, Christian Blatt Gimplet has defined heritage as something that produces something new in the, uh, in the present that has recourse uh, to the past uh, this is use of the history to produce something new in the present time. Um, for me, what uh, I, I got interested in this topic when I started seeing the Chinese government use history and heritage uh, for political purposes, and this is the famous words of, of Xi Jinping uh, when promoting Belt and Road Initiative, historical and cultural heritage, tell vivid stories of the past that profoundly influence the present and future. And suddenly we can see it in, in many cases in the pronouncements of many other people where heritage is used then to claim uh, territories, especially in South China Sea. Uh, and then this group of people who do underwater cultural heritage have been trying to identify sites that the Chinese can claim as heritage and then expand on, on territorial sovereignty. So uh, lots of things are coming together uh, and what I was interested in was to see the role of UNESCO in all, all this and UN organizations. One of the uh, key disputes that came up to UN was about the islands that were in dispute between China and 
uh, and, and Philippines, uh, where again, China asserted that uh, historically they were the ones to discover many of these islands, name them, and, and that's why these places belong to China. So use of historical underwater archeology span and heritage to claim territories in South China Sea. Um, and I think many of you know that this was a setback for, for China in that kind of a historical narrative that they were presenting uh, against Philippines uh, and the, the UN then came back, the, the, the convention really pointed out that that was not the case and it went in favor of, of Philippines. So all these legal issues that were coming up uh, claiming territories using heritage and history was something that I was really uh, looking into the role of UNESCO and UN more broadly, but uh, the fact that PRC joins UNESCO at a much later stage uh, is related to its open door policy in 1985. Soon after that, uh, Great Wall uh, is inscribed uh, as a World Heritage Site in 1987. Um, and then there was a heritage craze in China resulting in uh, 57 sites uh, in China that are inscribed as cultural heritage sites, natural heritage sites, and mixed sites. Uh, it is now ranked second to Italy uh, in the listing of heritage sites under UNESCO. Uh, it plays a, reading, a leading role in nominating sites across the Silk Road, uh, both the overland and maritime uh, Silk Road starting with 2014. That year is quite important because it's a year after the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, announced by President Xi Jinping. Uh, and subsequently, China has contributed to UNESCO $65 million uh, annually. These are some of the sites uh, that are under World Heritage listing. A tremendous amount of paperwork goes behind this, but it also involves uh, UNESCO be part of, uh, of nominating and then inscribing the sites uh, when uh, U.S. withdrew, uh, China was deeply engaged in UNESCO, um, and, and that brought concern uh, to the Biden administration, uh, and it came back and rejoined UNESCO. So there is a geopolitics involved in um, China's heritage nomination. Um, so what, what I see, and the, I, I will trace back this beginning of geopolitics, China and UNESCO to 1988 when uh, UNESCO launched the Silk Roads project and it started supporting China in many ways. This mutual collaboration between uh, PRC and UNESCO starts, I think, from this project in 88, uh, where UNESCO also funded uh, several institutions. This is, of course, pre-BRI projects that we see. Scholarship uh, increases tremendously, supported by UNESCO. This is one of the first conferences that was held about uh, the Maritime Silk Road in Chuanzhou. Uh, we also have uh, un uh, Maritime Silk Road as a site that China wants to nominate. Well, the one first successful nomination was in 2021, the city of Chuanzhou was inscribed as a World Heritage Site. Uh, it is now closely linked to the idea of Maritime Silk Road and the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, and then also linked to the uh, uh, archaeology, underwater archaeology and territorial sovereignty. Uh, I call this uh, the Silk Road ecosystem where the Chinese government's politics, UNESCO and geopolitics are all linked up. Uh, so this is uh, the reason why I think if you trace uh, the nomination process uh, and the inscription of Chuanzhou is quite fascinating about how the first attempt failed. Uh, and then uh, the UNESCO then asked China to uh, rewrite and resubmit the application. And in 2021, it was successful in inscribing uh, Chuanzhou as, as a site. I've discussed this in a recent article, uh, which talks about the invention of the Maritime Silk Road, uh, looking at the connection between how the process of nominating various sites uh, in China by 2013, 2014, gets linked up into the geopolitics. And that, I argue, is also having impact on UNESCO and how it runs things uh, from, uh, from, from its uh, headquarters in Paris. Um, so I'll conclude with a couple of things about how this mutual uh, dependence, I would say, between 
the PRC and UNESCO with regard to heritage actually goes beyond heritage. Heritage uh, listing of the sites usually promotes tourism that is given not only in PRC, but in many different places as well. Uh, but it is also used in, in, in the PRC to improve its image as an universally uh, globally integrated open nation. So it's an image building activity as well. So beyond just tourism, it serves China's purpose of telling the people that it is not a threat, uh, it is globally integrated and it is an uh, open nation compared to others. Um, one of the ways in which I see PRC changing um, the institution UNESCO is by contributing money. Um, so the ICOMOS committee that I was on was actually funded by the PRC government. Um, so it seems that because of that funding, uh, and it's not just China, earlier US had done the same thing, but the shift that Manjiri was making, uh, telling us about, seems to be taking place in UNESCO from the US or Europe dominated UNESCO moving to China because China is able to provide lots of funding uh, to UNESCO at this point. But at the same time, uh, uh, the use of UNESCO and heritage is now going into the geopolitic or geopolitical initiatives like Belt and Road Initiative, but even extending uh, to South China Sea uh, territorial claims. So I would say at this point, we are in the middle stages of a transformation of UNESCO and the UNESCO's relationship with the PRC. I think this is something that we may have to watch out uh, in the next five, 10 years. Okay, I'll end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sen. Um, you know, in a slight change of order, maybe I'm going to suggest that Professor Arlene Tickner go next and then we bring Professor Renshaw in last. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. Um, I'll start off by, I'm going to time myself, sorry, because I tend to speak a long time. Um, I'll start off by thanking uh, the invitation as well to participate in this, in this conversation. Um, I want to make a disclaimer. Um, I'm speaking um, on my behalf as an academic and a professor of international relations more than as ambassador and deputy permanent representative of Colombia to the United Nations. Um, but I, I can't help but admit that my experience at the United Nations um, has obviously um, uh, not tainted, affected my reading um, of, of, of multilateralism and the workings of the international system. Um, I'd like to make um, six brief points in these 10 minutes. Um, on, on the role of Latin America uh, within the United Nations, which was basically the question that was posed to me. Um, and I wanna start off by acknowledging the obvious that Omar has already pointed to, which is the demise of the Western modern liberal world order. Um, signs of this demise, if not collapse, are, are all around us. Um, and I just wanna point out several that I think are important to highlight. Um, First, obviously, the efficacy of multilateralism is, 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 is under question. Um, the commitment to democracy, human rights, gender equality, and many other gains um, of, of, of this system. Um, militarization as an answer to many problems is on the rise. Arms spending is on the rise. Um, and to my dis dismay, um, the nuclear threat and the nuclear option um, has resurfaced and, and, and something that we thought a thing, a thing of the past is now being discussed um, in the hallways and the corridors of the United Nations, which is how we go about addressing, again, um, the, the impending nature of, of, of the threat of nuclear weapons and, and the increasing acceptance of nuclear weapons um, as a tool for the security um, of certain states. Um, since I've been at the United Nations, something that's perhaps surprised me at least, and perhaps I'm naive, is, is how openly both the UN system and member states um, acknowledge that there's a crisis, acknowledge the paralysis um, of the organization and of the multilateral system writ large um, to address these multiple crises. Um, and yet um, we're talking about a system that's very hard pressed to devise transformative action um, to attend to 
um, all the, of these things that are going on in the world. And I think the, 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 the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the genocide that's unfolding in Gaza before our eyes is, is simply the most egregious example of this decay. The inability of the Security Council to reach any type of resolution acceptable to all of its members um, is points, I think, to this paralysis and the incapacity um, of the organization to attend to problems such as this. Um, and obviously, um, the, 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 the cost in human lives um, of, of this political bickering and, 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 and posing. So based upon this bleak picture, and this is kind of the second point I want to make, which is very brief, I could probably end my presentation right here by saying that no country or region in the world, including Latin America and the Caribbean, is reshaping international organizations um, such as the UN in a transformative way, which was the is the title of the event that we are, are participating in today. Um, and by this, I mean in a way conducive to attending to the multiple crises that we face, um, both as humans, non-humans, and the planet. Um, but I won't do that. Um, instead, let me briefly spell out a few ways in which I think some Latin American countries are trying to plant the seeds for positive change within the UN or to maintain changes already gained, but that are today under threat. Um, and here I want to make just four brief points. Um, first, um, and I won't, I don't want to talk about this too much, but there's a lot of talk um, since the, the war in Ukraine about non-alignment and a new doctrine of non-alignment um, as being practiced by specific countries in, in the global south and in this case in, in Latin America. Um, several um, scholars in Latin America um, have called this active non-alignment, which I won't go into the details of, but, but indeed, um, notwithstanding um, the oldness of the concept um, on matters such as China-U.S. tensions, um, the Russia-Ukraine war, and even the war now between Israel and Palestine, uh, many countries of Latin America and the Caribbean have attempted to adopt a middle path um, that avoids taking sides in keeping with the notion of non-alignment, but that also tries to defend core principles such as sovereignty, such as non-intervention, such as human rights, um, such as international humanitarian law. So I see this potentially as a different doctrine, um, perhaps than that as practice previously by the non-aligned countries. And, and just let me say that based on my experience in the UN, uh, the non-aligned movement um, has very little influence um, within the organization today, sadly, and potentially needs to go back to its principles, its founding principles, and redesign itself and recraft itself with an eye to regaining that important role that it had at some point within the organization. But this is you know, potentially a way in which certain countries of Latin America are trying to, to create you know, space um, and, and change. Um, on a more practical level, um, there are countries in Latin America, including my own Colombia, that have been quite influential in, for example, um, creating uh, the, the 2030 agenda and, and the sustainable development goals. Um, however, um, uh, the midterm review of these goals um, points to um, lagging on pretty much all of the different SDGs. So I, I'm not sure that we could call that transformation. Um, and on many fronts, um, such as gender, human rights, um, LGBTQI plus rights, um, democracy, um, I would say that, that certain countries of Latin America are standing up um, as defenders of, of what we may call the remnants of, of the liberal order, but which I at least find to be important issues um, and, and, and principles. Um, and, and I say this because as a scholar of the Global South, um, something that's drawn my attention, um, and, and, and we don't speak about this openly as post-colonial or decolonial scholars, is that indeed many countries of the Global South um, are quite regressive um, on many of these issues. And so these are these are issues that are under threat. We're seeing backsliding in accepted language on gender and whatnot. And many countries in Latin America um, are, are, are standing up to try to defend these 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 gains, and I would call them gains. Um, in the realm of security, is, which is something that I just wanted to mention, um, I think what's surprising, at least to me, observing how things are playing out in the Security Council, is how, um, you know, notwithstanding the existence of BRICS, um, 
when a country such as Brazil um, is, is on the Security Council, which it is now, Mexico was a member just in the previous period, when it comes to kind of, you know, the key geostrategic tensions that we're observing in the world, um, there are no uh, signs of solidarity uh, among uh, countries such as, as China and Russia with Brazil. So in, in a specific case, for example, of what's going on now um, between Israel and Palestine, um, Brazil exercises the presidency of the Security Council and has been hard, now now is leaving its period, was completely hard pressed to create a resolution um, that would be acceptable um, to all members, permanent members, um, including Russia and, and China. Um, the fifth point uh, I want to make uh, has to do with potentially more transgressive and transformative spaces in which I think countries of Latin America have been particularly vocal. And, and here I want to mention the permanent forums um, of indigenous peoples and of peoples of African descent. Um, I see these two spaces um, as important ones that bring together uh, civil society actors um, and states um, in which difficult and uncomfortable conversations um, are being struck um, on matters such as uh, participation of citizens of the world in, in global politics, including within uh, the United Nations, racism, racial justice, reparations, um, issues of care um, related to the rights of Mother Nature, and obviously rights in general related to uh, populations and situations of vulnerability and whatnot. And so I see these two spaces um, as potentially driving transformative conversations that may at least plant some seeds um, for forward-looking change within the UN. Um, and finally, I just want to make a last point, and, and my 10 minutes are almost up, um, that, that has to do with this notion of transformation from below. We talk about this a lot in academia, and, and I'm seeing in the United Nations a lot of talk about the need to engage with you know, different actors construct from below. Um, and yet doing so in a genuine and, and constructive way, I think is, is difficult um, for a system, uh, obviously based on the membership um, of, of, of nation states. Um, at different national levels, um, I see this happening within Latin America in terms of, you know, co-construction of public policy from the bottom up. And here I just wanted to mention, um, and, and, and I would be remiss if I didn't say something about Colombia and my capacity now <laughs> as representative of the country to the UN. Um, the Colombia's peace process, which is victim-centered and gender transformative, is just one example um, of what the current government in Colombia is trying to do in terms of um, building public policy from below. And so our peace process, in addition to being victim-centered, was very much driven um, by the victims of the conflict and of social actors and situations of vulnerability, starting with women's organizations. And this experience is basically played out now in the designing of our national action plan, um, of our security and defense policy, um, of our first uh, national action plan on Resolution 1325, on women, peace, and security, um, among other realms, our drug policy, and so, um, at least in, in the conversations that I participate in the United Nations, um, I, I've been trying to push this notion that if we are to actually envision um, some way, um, some way to, to build from, um, I'll, I'll cite a friend of mine, that from the compost left by the, you know, by, 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 the, by the, the liberal world order and decay, we really do not, we really do need to start thinking um, beyond um, uh, member states and, and how to go about um, tapping into knowledges um, and, and voices and experiences of, of different social actors from below. And so I'll stop there. And sorry for going over a bit. Yeah, that was perfect, Professor Tichner. Thank you very much um, for your remarks. And um, I think we go back now to Professor Renjiao. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the name New School always reminds me of my friend uh, who sadly is no longer with us, uh, Professor Lily Lin. Uh, actually, I have her book, uh, The Door of World Politics, uh, before me. Um, on one occasion, I went to New School uh, to see uh, Professor Lin. Um, and it was a fond memory. Um, 
Well, uh, there are four sentences uh, which uh, characterize China's uh, foreign policy thinking. And one of them uh, is uh, multilateral institutions uh, uh, are an important uh, stage. Namely, for China, uh, multilateral institutions uh, are uh, an important stage uh, in which China can play an important role. Many years ago, China was a revolutionary state in world politics, seeing uh, the United Nations as a puppet of uh, great powers. Uh, and China even fought a war with quote unquote UN troops in the Korean War. Um, and the name United Nations Command is still being used um, uh, so many years uh, later. Uh, that changed in 1971 uh, when the People's Republic of China uh, became a member of the United Nations formally. Um, and a more important watershed is the launch of reform and opening up in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Over the past four decades, uh, China has been increasingly integrating uh, into uh, the world. China has joined almost all the international covenants, uh, international institutions uh, and organizations. Uh, it is increasingly becoming uh, a constructive force in world affairs. Against this backdrop, um, China persistently attaches much importance uh, to the United Nations. And there are uh, many facts uh, 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 that can support uh, this argument. Uh, first, China today uh, pays the second uh, biggest UN dues corresponding to its second largest economy, the world's second largest economy status. Um, China has uh, supported uh, the United Nations to overcome its uh, financial problems. Uh, second, China has actually participated in the UN peacekeeping operations. Uh, the personnel it has sent uh, for UN peacekeeping operations uh, exceeds other P5, P4 uh, uh, combined. Um, and sadly, uh, 16 of, of them uh, lost their lives uh, over the years in countries uh, such as uh, Mali uh, and South Sudan. Um, third, China has made voluntary donations uh, to the UN to establish a uh, UN Peace and Development Fund um, with a to with a, the total amount uh, amount of uh, one billion uh, U.S. dollars. There are two sub funds uh, uh, within it. One is uh, Secretary, Gen Secretary General's uh, Peace and Security Fund, uh, and another is uh, a sub fund for the implementation of 2030 uh, Sustainable uh, Development. Uh, so in addition to, uh, to its UN dues, uh, China has made uh, voluntary and 
extra donations uh, to support the causes of uh, the United Nations. Uh, fourth, China has also has been supportive of, of other UN agencies, uh, for example, UNESCO, which has been uh, mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, when you, UNESCO had, had, had problems, um, it uh, was not able to continue the publication of its magazine. Uh, and uh, uh, then China stepped in, uh, uh, made donations to uh, support uh, the public, the publication, uh, the, the resumption of uh, the publication of, of UNESCO ma magazine, and so forth. Um, fifth, China has actively participated in inter-civilizational dialogues. Uh, these dialogues, uh, uh, I think, are intellectually significant uh, for the world. Uh, uh, we all remember the, the clash of civilizations uh, argument. Uh, and uh, uh, the UN has been doing uh, 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 very use useful and important work uh, to promote inter-civilizational uh, dialogue, uh, including a, an alliance of uh, civilizations, uh, which uh, is continuing its 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 work. Um, and we and uh, there are many other facts uh, 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 along this line, and I cannot think of any other country which is more uh, supportive uh, of the UN than China, uh, more enthusiastic uh, than China uh, uh, to support the United Nations these days. And I think the most important reason is that uh, China is convinced that uh, uh, the United Nations should play an important role as it is expected. And it can't play such a role uh, uh, in world affairs. Um, a world of, a world with the United Nations is a better place uh, than a world without the United Nations. Meanwhile, uh, today's China has has more capability uh, uh, than before uh, to do so. It has more influence uh, in world affairs. Um, uh, to play a larger role and also uh, uh, to uh, support uh, the world organization UN to, uh, to uh, play a, a more constructive role in world affairs. And this conclusion is reached um, not because I'm a Chinese national, uh, but it's based on uh, the many facts uh, 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 before us. Um, um, I'd like to stop there. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ren. And thank you to all our panelists. Um, in some ways, it's a you know, I, all of you have clearly reminded us that, yes, on the one hand, we have seen a demise of a U.S.-dominated, putatively liberal order, but what is emerging in its place is not some uniformly transformative, cohesive alternative. Um, instead, what you see is a real plurality that is marked by different worldviews and different interests. Um, and so we do have questions and I do encourage the audience to add additional questions to the Q&A. But before we go to the questions from the audience, I wanted to give an opportunity to each panelist to maybe address um, comments that you all have made about <clears throat> how to address this plurality so that potentially it doesn't lead to continuing 
paralysis of the sort that Professor Tickner described in the UN Security Council, but can potentially lead to avenues to opportunities for um, producing a different kind of multilateralism. Do any of you want to kind of address each other's um, comments or a broader question before we take on specific questions from the audience? Okay, so then maybe we'll just jump to the Q&A. Uh, so there is a question which is, from my um, India-China Institute co-director, Professor Mark Fraser, um, and it's to any or all the panel. Um, so he asks, one of the central flaws of the liberal international order, many claim, was the failure to fulfill the principles of multilateralism because of great power dominance. What are the prospects of multilateralism in a post-liberal international order if, as it appears, the shift is to a bipolar a multipolar world dominated by a few powerful states. Who wants to take on Mark's question? Uh, yeah. I, does anyone else want to begin? <laughs> or was I the first? <laughs> no, go ahead, Professor Dickner. Yeah. I I mean, this this ties into another question that I'm reading in the Q and A, but I'll I'll hold off on that. Um, I I don't know what the answer is. Um, as the as in the Q and A, the, the the person who asks suggests um, change in multilateralism is so slow, um, so difficult to achieve. Um, and 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 now at a practical level, I actually ask myself the same question every day, and I don't think that there's a clear answer. Um, there have been many attempts um, within the, the, the United Nations, um, which is the only multilateral, global multilateral system that we have. I mean, um, notwithstanding its paralysis and failures, I don't see an alternative today. Many attempts to reform the Security Council, right? Many attempts to uh, a, 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 at least exercise some degree of control over the veto. Um, and yet it's been very difficult. So I could point out seeds of, of 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 accountability and change such as a veto initiative um that was that was presented just a year ago and approved um which demands that every time a permanent member exercises the veto um a hearing if you like must be held um in the general assembly um to explain and and account for the reasons behind that decision but i've been participating actively in the conversations um on security sector reform and given the number of camps and the entrenched interests at stake, um, and here I'm not only speaking of current permanent members, but those that aspire to acquire permanent membership, given their important role in the world today, it's very difficult to envision how um, any type of change is possible. And so um, I, I, I'm hard pressed um, to, 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 to devise a, a, more, a more positive response. Um, I, I think also, um, there's a, I think, I mean, there's a lot to say for some of the principles um, that have underwritten this now decaying or crumbling or, or already dead um, liberal order, um, such as democracy, such as human rights, and such as gender um, and other types of rights that, that are under attack. And so I, I'm not sure that at least I, I am ready to, to throw away everything, um, you know, for the sake of, of, of building something completely new. That's what I would say. No, thank you very much, Professor I, Baba. I, sorry, no, sorry. Go ahead, Professor uh, Ren. Go ahead. Um, well, I think uh, the Security Council reform is the most difficult part of uh, UN reform um, because uh, that involves of of uh, uh, struggles uh, uh, between among uh, the, the the major powers. Um, uh, uh, China may be unhappy uh, about uh, Japan's becoming a permanent member. Uh, some other powers may be unhappy about uh, India's uh, becoming a permanent member. 
and so forth. Um, so uh, no progress uh, yet uh, uh, to date. Um, but um, uh, except uh, Security Council at home, there are uh, many other things uh, in terms of uh, UN reform. Um, there are many other things uh, uh, that are possible uh, to do. Uh, for example, um, uh, the UN, the, 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 well, UN will continue to be criticized for its oversized bureaucracy. Uh, it's fat. It's 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 bureaucratic. It's always been uh, criticized of of, of being uh, bureaucratic. So uh, the the reform of of uh, UN organization. Uh, uh, in that there are there are many things that that can be uh, uh, discussed and reformed, uh, I believe. Uh, so yes, Security Council is in, Security Council reform is important, but it's but it's it, it more difficult uh, to do. And there are there are other uh, many other things that may be less difficult uh, to do. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you very much, Professor Ren, for that reminder of maybe not starting reform and transformations by grappling with the most intransigent part of the, the problem. Uh, Professor Ba, I'm curious if you had some comments to make about reforms within the ICC. Uh, yes, um, before I get to the ICC, I just want to uh, reiterate briefly what both Professor Ren and Tikna said um, about the UN. Um, the UN not being one thing, um, there's a lot of multiple things at, at the UN, and of course, some aspect of the UN's work has been much more progressive than, than others, and also the UN being just one agent or one institution within the international liberal order itself. And uh, the question about whether this is a matter of unfulfilled promises of multilateralism, whether this crisis shows that the ideals that were put in place after World War II haven't been met. The more I think about a liberal international order, the less convinced I am that actually these are unfulfilled promises. I'm questioning even the premise that these pro these promises were made to, to begin with, because the more one reads about the archives and these debates um, when these institutions were put in place, you realize that how regressive actually some of these were and how um, entrenched some of these uh, interests were, and also just the lack of will to make or to believe in a universal ideal uh, and progressive ideas to get to. So I don't think it's necessarily a matter of unfulfilled promises. I think that these promises were not made to begin with. There were no idea of building a universal system that would center equal dignity for all or sovereign equality for all states. Um, regarding the ICC, and as many institutions, the ICC has been in crisis since day one, basically, and every year it, it shows basically how uh, unequipped it is to actually deal with uh, um, the reason for which it was created, meaning holding perpetrators accountable for um, these uh, crimes. The ICC launched a, a, a study a couple of years ago about how to reform itself. Um, they wrote, uh, I think, something like 600 page um, report about what to do and how to move forward. Some of these um, recommendations are easier to implement than, than others, but still with each new crisis that comes up um, in international law, it just becomes even more blatant that the ICC is actually not well equipped to deal with it again because of the for for large part because of the politics of the great powers who want to do everything in their capability to shield their themselves their citizens their military from the reach of international justice 
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ba. Uh, Professor Sen, did you want to jump in on this question? Yeah, um, I, I'm not a political scientist, but uh, I see multilateral uh, institutions, but I don't know how to evaluate them other than UN, uh, BRICS, for example, ASEAN the, is the, the one. ASEAN has not uh, really acted on Myanmar uh, and uh, it, it gets conflicted with uh, the overland uh, uh, states of, of Southeast Asia and the maritime states of Asia, Southeast Asia. So I don't know how do you, uh, beyond, I mean, the criticism of UN, it's a bureaucracy, it's a large institution, but even the smaller multinational institutions, uh, are they successful? Uh, BRICS, uh, uh, Russia, China, India, even South Africa uh, have not criticized Russia against Ukraine. Um, uh, there are problems between India and China. So I don't know if uh, multilateral institutions can work when there are bilateral dis uh, disputes uh, among different states. Uh, so I think just blaming UN will not do. I mean, if we, if we have to look at the multinational institutions, I think all of them uh, have failed. Um, so I, I don't think it's about bureaucracy, it's something else that may be responsible. Uh, UN Security Council reform, uh, Professor Ren said there are many states who don't like uh, uh, India's uh, nomination to the Security Council. I don't know other than China, which other state has said it. So perhaps uh, Professor Ren can point out which uh, other state is uh, against India joining the Security Council. And I think that also comes down to bilateral issues between India and China rather than a global issue. So I think um, the multinational institutions uh, may be failing, not because of bureaucracy, but because of bilateral and smaller disputes among different nations. And then how to address that is, is an issue. But I also see a question that is uh, directed to me, uh, Manjiri, should I go ahead and answer that or wait? Go ahead, Tansen, why don't you do that? Yeah. So yeah, should I so tell that question? So, so this is a question from James Anderson, who um, asks, has China participated in the establishment of transnational UNESCO sites within the theme of the Maritime Silk Road? Are all maritime sites linked to unilateral territorial sovereignty claims? Yeah, so uh, so it started with the serial nomination of the over, Overland Silk Road uh, and they decided to nominate these sites according to corridors. So only one corridor uh, that includes China, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan uh, has been inscribed. The others have not. It's a long due process. Many because it's a nation state uh, uh, nominated site, so it, it requires multiple states to take place. And following the overland one, China was pushing for. A maritime Silk Road nomination that would include multiple states across the Indian Ocean. Uh, but it, it comes back to the dispute in territories. Uh, and even the name Maritime Silk Road is a problem for many states because if you use Maritime Silk Road, it has a Chinese identity. India, for example, doesn't want that to be the name for these kinds of serial nomination. Uh, but it seems unlikely that uh, this kind of nomination uh, in the uh, maritime Silk Road area will take place given the territorial disputes uh, and also the naming problem is, is quite important uh, because beyond the maritime Silk Road, this term, there are other places, especially uh, in, in South Asia that do not fall into that category. So I, th I think there's a problem. It has not taken off from a very basic rudimentary discussion or whether or not uh, this uh, nomination should take place and it stopped at deciding that that name Maritime Silk Road should not be used. That was a recommendation uh, of the committee that was looking into the proposal, which was again funded by the Chinese government. Thank you, Professor Sen. Um, do any of you want to um, answer what the previous panelists said or I'll move on to the next question? Okay, so there are a couple of questions. Uh, are, I, yes, of course. Can Professor. I add a few words? Um, regarding Security Council reform, um, the question is not a uh, country A should become uh, a permanent member or not. Uh, the question is not country B should become a, become a permanent member or not, but rather that it's an overall uh, uh, reform deal. 
uh, about Security Council. Uh, how many how many members uh, uh, should it uh, should it have? Uh, and uh, 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 what about uh, veto power? Uh, uh, those kind of issues. So it quickly touches uh, on the, the the sensitive nerves of of uh, uh, of many countries. Uh, that's why it is it is so difficult uh, 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 to do. Thank you. Yeah. No. I think Professor and you are capturing as the other speakers what many of our questioners are also asking, which is you know very quickly one gets caught up in bilateral competition and conflict, and maybe what one needs to do is not about memberships and individual privileges, but come up with some broad overarching general principles. But we have a question from Professor Idris, or maybe not Professor Idris, Paul Arman, who says, um, who's asking a similar sort of query, historically different regions have promoted distinct challenges to the international order. This is a gross generalization, but still contains some truth. Many Latin American states have been firmly attached to liberal values and have fought to hold the liberal international order to core Western liberal values in part by limiting state sovereignty. In contrast, states in Southeast Asia have been firmly attached to non-intervention and have been wary of taking additional international obligations under human rights instruments, for example. African states, while often supportive of new institutions in the areas of human rights and international criminal law, have pushed them to shift their focus towards issues of colonialism and racial discrimination. Um, what are ways to overcome these divergent goals to pursue a shared transformative agenda? Are these views compatible within a common movement? And let me maybe, this is a big question and to some extent we already have answers, somewhat pessimistic answers from the panelists, but maybe I can add to this question by saying, are there international institutions out there which we do see as exemplars? which have either undergone reform from older forms or a new institutions, which reflect in a more salutary way, um, you know, some of the values that Professor Baum mentioned at the outset, a respect for human dignity at the outset, more neutral execution of court principles, um, respect for sovereignty in a more neutral way. So can we, think of institutions of global governance, which are exemplars that we could work on. So instead of constantly working with critique, can we also think of positive examples? Uh, I will just say, I'm not totally sure whether this, uh, the best way to frame this is whether these have been positive examples or not, but we can see instances where institutions were able to be reformed in a whole different way. Um, and the AU is one instance um, when African countries uh, went from the OAU to the AU, which was not just a change in the name, but the whole orientation and disposition of the institution, changing some of the frameworks, um, having now the ability to actually intervene in domestic political affairs, having the ability to intervene uh, militarily when there are gross violations of human rights, creating a, a regional court uh, for human rights. So maybe the feature of multilateralism is actually regional. Um, I think they need to pay more attention to what is happening at the regional level. Now, this change from the OAU to the AU has still is a challenge, of course. But even the idea of coming to the realization that in the post-World War II era, in the post-Cold War era, the OAU were no longer adequate for managing um, the security challenges, human rights challenges led to this whole um, creation of a new organization uh, could be one example of states have come to decide that they need new tools actually to face current challenges. Can I just ask you to elaborate a little bit more on that, Professor Ba? What did you think were the ingredients which allowed these states who had conflicting interests um, and interests which were contrary to having an international body intervene in domestic affairs? 
what were the ingredients that allowed them to come together and agree to these common principles? Um, part of it has to be with uh, a common, not common history, but a shared experience. And we can see that, for instance, when there are deliberations to create international institutions. And not all African countries speak with the same voice. Of course, they do have their own um, different interests. But if we take together um, the orientation that they put in place, we can see that this is shared legacy of colonial domination permeates what they propose. And I would say you could potentially the same thing coming from a lot of Latin American countries that shared um, history of having, having been sub subjected to colonial domination does lead a lot of these states to have similar ideas of what kind of institutions and mechanisms could be put in place to protect the weaker from, um, again, uh, great powers basically abusing these institutions for their own narrow interest. Thank you, uh, Professor Tina, yeah. Um, I, I can, I, I wanna add to what Omar has just, has just said, just um, kind of speaking more practically. Um, the question, um, the question assumes that Latin America has not, has been willing to, to cede sovereignty and, and, and and be flexible on the principle of non-intervention um, in order to favor liberal principles. That I think that that is a mistaken assumption. Um, if anything, Latin America as a region has uh, been a staunch defender of sovereignty and non-intervention. So just just want to make that clarification. And so these are these are principles that obviously um, uh, around which the global South in general converges, um, and and that's one. Um, important area of of of, of agreement. Um, I I in terms of kind of practical processes, I also see room for important alliances um, being struck around colonial legacies um, and and issues of racial justice and and reparations that Omar has hinted at, but not stated in, expressly in that way. Um, and in this sense much work needs to be done um, in bridging um, gaps between uh, the African continent and Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, one would assume that there are strong ties um, between, uh, for instance, the countries of the Caribbean um, and, and those countries in Latin America that host um, the largest populations of Afro descendants with the African continent, and yet there aren't um, th those strong ties. Um, I think this is one of this is one of the uh, legacies of colonialism um, and, and, and what we would call coloniality today. And so work is being done, which is why I mentioned the permanent forum of peoples of African descent to try to bridge this gap. And so we're seeing um, increasing um, convenings between the African Union and CARICOM, for example, and attempts by countries such as Colombia and Brazil that are Two, um, the two South American countries that host the largest Afro-descendant populations to join in um, these efforts to build, I don't know if I would call it kind of a, a renewed and recrafted Pan-Africanism or what, but these are spaces that are emerging uh, in order to find um, common ground. Another area on which I would say there's strong convergence. Um, I, I don't want to call it development, which was kind of you know the, the the overarching umbrella of the G77, which is a tremendously large and diverse grouping of countries that does not agree on any, practically anything. But the whole question of financing um, is I'm seeing is actually something um, that 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 actually does strike up. Um, important uh, spaces of, of agreement and convergence. And so calls to reform uh, international, the whole international financial um, institutional architecture is, is, is I think, a, a, a call that actually brings together the great majority of, of countries of the Global South um, today. Uh, the need to re-envision, um, you know, how uh, debt is addressed and how financing is executed is something else that we could that we could point to. Um, 
I'm going to stop there. I have some other ideas about kind of transformation, but I cannot think of one institution, quite honestly, that would point forward. Um, wait, I do have an idea. The General Assembly and the veto initiative. So I mentioned that already. I mean, we, there are small examples within the United Nations itself um, of attempts by member countries, small ones. In this case, it's, it's Liechtenstein that proposed the veto initiative in the General Assembly. It was approved unanimously almost um, by the General Assembly, and it provides the General Assembly with a tool to at least demand accountability um, to those permanent members of the Security Council when they exercise the veto. So although small, it is actually um, a, a gesture um, that unites countries um, towards um, some form of change in the ways in which key decisions are made um, on crucial issues surrounding security. Well, thank you, Professor Dickner, uh, Professor Ren, and Professor Sen. Any comments on places of reform, transformation, or new institutions that show us avenues of how to straddle okay. plurality? I think there aren't uh, that uh, good examples. I agree with Professor Tinker. Right? There, there's no multinational organization that I can think of that will get, provide us any kind of a pathway to create some kind of, a, I mean, even um, you know, the ASEAN, as I was pointing out, was something that was there to solve regional issues and it has failed on a number of occasions. So if that organization in Asia, I mean, we have talked about Latin America and Africa, but in Asia, if there's an organization, uh, it was meant to be ASEAN. Uh, but uh, again, that has not succeeded. Uh, I don't know what's happening with BRICS. That's more transregional. New member states are coming in, uh, but I don't know what they are doing in order to address issues that we are facing today. So again, I, I also don't have any examples of institutions that we can model ourselves to. I think there has to be these small changes that Professor Tinker is mentioning to address larger issues, uh, but that requires people to sit down and discuss those. Uh, and I think the bilateral problems interfere in these kinds of processes. Um, so I, I don't know, I don't have any examples. Well, I think, uh, uh... East Asia has been uh, more successful uh, over the past uh, four decades. Uh, something scholars call the long peace since uh, 1979. Um, uh, there has been no uh, new conflict, uh, military conflict in this region. Um, it has been uh, peaceful. And uh, uh, in the meantime, uh, East Asia has been uh, more successful in terms of uh, economic development. Um, and uh, 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 so, so there must be, be, be some, some lessons uh, uh, that can be learned from, from its experience. And what would you say some of those lessons are? In a way that Professor Barr, when talking about the reform of the OAU into the African Union, talked about there was a shared legacy and memory of colonialism. Um, I'm curious, in the East Asian region, um, what would you see as lessons that the rest of us could learn from? But at the same time, Manjiri, I think there's no institution that governs the East Asia. So it's, it's a nation state separately. So if you're talking about an institution, there's no East Asia institution. How about how about uh, 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 ten, what, 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 what people call uh, 10 plus 3? Uh, 10 ASEAN member states plus China, Japan, and South Korea. Uh, uh, it, it, it can be called an institution, maybe, uh, but, uh, but, but less, less institutionalized. Uh, then, uh, 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 for example, ASEAN, <laughs> which is uh, which is a Southeast Asian uh, regional organization. But I think one of the things that has come out from this round is that there perhaps there is um, um, 
greater value in maybe at least initially thinking in regional terms rather than in universal global terms and thinking about regional alliances and institutions rather than just struggling to reforming the UN as a way of thinking about multilateralism. Um, I, I wanted to take on at least one other question from the Q&A box. And in some ways it touches upon Professor Tickner, what you talked about, maybe the role of non-governmental actors, whether they be civil society actors, whether they be exchanges within academics and scientists and so on and so forth. So this question says many thanks for a really interesting presentation, I completely agree that transformation most often comes from below. And you mentioned the important role of middle powers and also that of civil society. The problem is that this type of transformation tends to happen quite slowly and the challenges we face are too urgent. For instance, several middle powers over the years have presented many proposals of reform to the UN to no avail. Do you see other avenues? Um, and are there other ways to expedite urgent reforms of the multilateral system? Um, and in these other avenues, I guess I'm suggesting that we not just look at government to government interactions, but other kinds of networks and institutions that could play a role in, in coming up with new understandings and new forms of multilateralism. And I must say in a very, very, very minute way, I think of the India-China Institute in some ways as trying to play that role of having you know, bringing people together from different parts of the world into conversations which are often difficult conversations. And just through that act of bringing people together on the same platform and having these conversations is, I think, in itself a kind of contribution. But I'm curious if um, any of you want to talk about either civil society or epistemic community exchanges. I do. Um, I agree with you completely. Um, we could just end here. Um, I, I don't. I mean, if we, if we, I guess I would say that the the existential challenges that we face today, um, which are multiple, and and impending, they're, it's not like they're happening um, decades away. They're happening now. Um, if they aren't addressed um, soon and, and systematically and differently, um, we we are predestining ourselves. I hate to say this and be so gloom, but it's I think it's a scientific fact. We 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 are we are destined to to self extinction um, um, of both ourselves as humans and 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 of of other than humans. And so, I believe that that is a scientific fact. Um, the science indicates that. And so. Nothing short of of you know revolutionary change um, in 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 our ways of of thinking about um, how we 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 are and act in the world and between ourselves is is needed um, in order to at least um, if not halt um, you know uh, make this make this impending process um, you know um, stop um, or you know so that that is you know that is that is my starting point for thinking about um what needs to be done and so I, I do think that um i do think that epistemic communities and kind of different social actors in particular those that have not participated in these conversations are fundamental for rethinking conceptually epistemologically ontologically um you know how how we go about doing the work required uh, to turn things around um, and obviously, states have an important role in this process. But it, it, you know, the 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 Westphalian state system is also in crisis. Um, nation states themselves um, have proven um, to be equally paralyzed um, in in the most case as as multilateral institutions in ter in terms of taking on these threats um, in systematic ways. And so. My president has spoken a lot about the need to decarbonize capitalism. Um, you know how feasible that is um, within the system that, in which we currently coexist. I, I think remains to be seen. But 
um, a, a, a rapid transition in terms of, of, of our production and consumption models is, is obviously required. And, and I'll just end by thinking more positively that I liken, if not this moment, the types of spaces that I imagine to um, to this project WAMP, the world ordering the world ordering models project, um, which which was a very interesting project that that went on for several decades, starting in the 1960s, um, that grouped together thinkers and thought leaders, if you like, from around the world to envision um, alternative uh, world orders. I, I think the moment that we live is even more. Um, challenging and threatening um, and, and, and urgent in terms of, of picking up on that type of activity. Um, and, and we're seeing um, people's movements across the world demanding that states and international organizations take stock of this moment and act. So the whole bottom up thing is, is I think, absolutely essential um, for, 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 for having any hope that we will be able to turn things around. Sorry. Thank you, Professor Tickner. Do any of the other panelists want to pitch in here? And we do have a question that I just want to throw in, and it's very much aligned with the previous question, um, which is, is there, and this is from Federico Menino, um, who's a NSSR PhD alum and current senior program officer at the Open Society Foundation. And his question is, do we see a special role for universities in particular and global educational networks in general in redefining, contributing to this more humane, hopefully, new world order? But Professor Baid, it looked like you were coming. Yeah, I mean, it would be great if universities could, could play um, that role in creating a more humane world. Um, but my sense is actually, at least in the West, and the system that I'm familiar with, the universities are just some big neoliberal institutions that oftentimes are not as progressive as they pretend to, to be. So um, I don't have much hope from, from that side. Sorry for I, ending with this. <laughs> I, I totally agree. See what's happening in the US. Uh, uh, I, I think we also see what's happening in India and China as well. Uh, do uh, universities really have autonomous power to do this? Uh, unfortunately, uh, what we are seeing over the last uh, couple of years, uh, no, uh, I totally <laughs> agree with Professor Pa as well. It, it's also a pessimistic uh, thing. So, And civil society is also problematic uh, in certain places where they are not allowed to function uh, so uh, it's the nation states, I think, that are preventing these kinds of bottom-up networks to form. So in, on one side, uh, the nation states themselves are creating problems among themselves and also at the same time, on the other hand, preventing uh, the bottom-up kind of creation of networks. So I think there has to be some kind of a discussion uh, about global order, uh, and, and I think we are not talking about it. I think it's very much bilateral issues that have prevented us, uh, Palestine, Israel, Ukraine, Russia, India, China, these are all bilateral issues. Uh, I, I don't know what's, uh, what kind of a discourse we, we need to have. Well, I, I do believe that um that uh, the intellectuals um, can play an, uh, an uh, important role. Uh, for example, when uh, uh, US and China uh, are engaged in a, a so-called uh, competition um, uh, over the past five, six years, um, I would like to say that, well, uh, there may be a component uh, which can be called a competition. But uh, a competition is, is, is only part of it, is only part of, of, of the picture. We, we should not use uh, a competition to, uh, to characterize 
uh, uh, the, the, the overall uh, bi bilateral relationship. There are many other uh, uh, aspects uh, or areas uh, between uh, the two countries. So when the governor of California uh, came here uh, for a visit, uh, he was he was uh, well received, and uh, uh, he he visited different parts of China, and uh, uh, has seen uh, uh, had met people uh, uh, different quarters, uh, see different uh, go went to the streets. And, and and so forth. That kind of uh, contact and people to people exchange uh, between Chinese and American intellectuals, for example, uh, it's, it's, it's very remains very important, uh, and and uh, and should should not uh, stop, should not decouple. Uh, I believe. Mm -hmm. No, thank you, Professor Ren, because that will be the last comment of the panel, and I'm glad that it's more optimistic and kind of signals how we have to perhaps be persistent, but also creative in finding and imagining new spaces within what otherwise seems like a somewhat pessimistic disarray of chaos and competition, um, and whether it be from people-to-people -people contact between intellectuals, civil society members, sub-national groups, um, and more. Um, you know, we have to find those arenas for dialogue and new understandings. But we are out of time, so I am going to wrap this up. I want to thank each and every one of our panelists, but especially the two of them who are joining us from China at a very late hour. Um, I also want to thank my colleagues in the Graduate Program in International Affairs and at the India-China Institute, and a special shout out to Grace Ho and her team um, for always managing the administration of these events so smoothly. Um, and thank you, lastly, but not least, to all our audience members. Goodbye.